from mine have never been good um, for my son with autism um, because he's a big guy and because he's um, he, when he was little he was really fast um, and he had a lot of sensory issues where he didn't like people touching him the wrong way he likes deep pressure um, if we had to do anything medical he still doesn't he hasn't well this is not good to say in front of dr. Karen but he hasn't had blood drawn in probably 10 years because we haven't we need to sedate him to do a bunch of things because he doesn't like to be touched the wrong way when you guys are trying to take blood or you're trying to listen to his heart we've just gotten to the point now where he is 19 and they were able the the nurses in the practice are able to take his uh, temperature you know with the this way mm -hmm. um, he still has trouble letting them look in his ears he will open his mouth and go like this but only for 10 seconds he will let them listen to his heart and he thinks that's funny because I think he's ticklish <laughs> but when he was little it was a four-person hold to do anything um, we had to have um, his um, an ear uh, what's that called help me I'm tubes, or tubes. tubes put in so initially when we went in I tried to reinforced with the folks because it was an outpatient surgery that this guy wasn't going to sit still for any length of time and that I needed to have something really quick to put him down with in order to get him calm because he was just not sure why we were even in this place um, and that was a fiasco so we had to get six people at that point and he was only about this tall so I can't tell you what it'd be like right now to sedate him um, <laughs> since he's six five and he's bigger than us uh, the last time we had to give him shots uh, my husband and I were holding him down and my husband's a big guy I'm not small by any means um, we were on top of him basically and um, it was a shot of penicillin because he was pretty sick the doc got the needle in and as he was getting the needle in Pat bucked like a horse and came up and the doc was worried that he broke off the, the, the needle so I guess what I'm trying to tell you is you have to listen to the parents we know our guys the best and since my guy's older and I don't know what the word is he, he's not really fond of the medical community he's done better as he's gotten older but again we have to do a bunch of testing we've got to do some blood work we've got to do some teeth we've got to do a bunch of things here soon but I've been procrastinating because to be quite honest with you I don't want to have to take him in and I've always worried about an emergency situation um, and we think I don't know if there's wood anywhere in this place. <laughs> We've never had an emergency situation to go in through the ER. Um, but on the flip side, his middle brother, he's the best patient you ever want to meet. He's, he's good. He's had probably 10 surgeries. Um, he understands he doesn't like the hospitals, um, but the docs always talk to him. That's another big thing, even with Pat. If you talk to the patient, not the parents, even when they're little, He's, Pat was still listening even though he was flying around the room so I think Marie brings up a really good point I think our response to care is based on the care that we've had and I think when we hold kids down because it's the quickest easiest route to get care to them like a shot or anything like that then you have somebody who's Pat size who's going oh you're gonna hold me down I'm not coming in nor am I gonna cooperate and I think that's one of the things that, that um, Karen and I are really working for especially when it comes to blood draws is that it's basic health care Everybody needs to have a blood draw a couple times in their lives, you know, especially if you, you know, have medical conditions that, that, that come as an, in your adult years. You have to condition kids now that health care is just a part of life and it's, it, it is a little bit scary, but you can get through it. I think we've all been through that experience where our children have been held down, mine included, and it takes so much longer to look in their ear and take their temperature because we just took them back you know three or four steps now they won't even come in the office door I mean Karen can tell you stories of patients that she actually has and I hope you don't mind if I tell this one <laughs> but she has actually done a, an exam with a child who won't even come in the building she goes out to the car to see him um, he's much better he's coming in the building he's now. coming in the building <laughs> brings me presents but I mean I think that it shows a couple of things one is we his experience have to do the been. dentist like that the dentist would have to come out and take a look at Pete's uh, Pat's teeth in the van because as soon as we pulled in he would go yeah but nice I think it's chair, just a though, couple it reclines things. and everything so yeah yeah but it's that whole thing he's back and there's all those think about all the sensory things yeah. you guys have that our guys just can't handle if you got a sensory guy that's I mean I don't know if you've talked about sensory but whoa not much but <laughs> but I think that, that the example smells of the hospital is, are bad is, 
<laughs> I think the, the point too is that I mean I think that the way that we approach care is very very important but also being adaptable to how kids respond to care which I think Karen has a lot of good examples of how she's adapted the environment to meet the needs of the child so that again effective care is the bottom line we all want effective care for our child you know you want effective care for you um, I should I tell my doctor story? So I was here at Ohio State uh, when I worked here, and I went in to see the doctor, and I did a lot of health care things going on. And she said to me, you know, are you under a lot of stress? And I said, well, you know, I do have this child with autism that I'm raising. And she said, oh, is he high-functioning or low-functioning? And I said, well, let me ask you this. Are you a high-functioning or low-functioning doctor? <laughs> she got the point. <laughs> and yeah. then I had a really good exam. <laughs> and actually, Every so time I've gone back to see her since then, <laughs> she reminds me of that statement that I made to her, which just flew out of my mouth. I mean, I didn't mean for it to. And, and um, but she has a friend who has a child with Down syndrome, and she always qualified him as low functioning. And now, and she was like, I feel really bad about that now. You know, I never saw him as a person. I saw him as a functioning level. And I think you need to see past that and go, these kids have personalities, traits, you know, and conditions, and they are, Human. they are, they are allowed to have good, effective health care. And a lot of it's going to come on the way, uh, you know, due to the fact of how you treat them and treat the family. We've actually, we've had a few good experiences and, and bad. Um, All right. Yeah. Hey. Um, She's we, got little kids, that's yeah, why. They're still little. Um, we had a good, actually, emergency room experience. It's the only time we've ever had to go to the emergency room. And that's because my seven-year-old, who was then five, shoved a craft bead up his nose at school. Um, and, you know, he doesn't understand when they're telling him to push it back down, so he kept sniffing up, and it got up there really far. So um, we, and we... We chose Riverside only because it's very close to his school. We didn't even go to Children's Hospital. And um, the doctor did an excellent job when they came into the room. My kids do fine, waiting in waiting areas. Um, that isn't too overwhelming for them. Um, we get in the room and the doctor did come in. He immediately greeted my son, which is a good first step. And then he immediately began to talk to me and ask me, um, you know, how does autism affect him? That's the best question you can ever ask. Not are they low functioning, are they high functioning, are they severe, my favorite word. Um, how does it affect I'm, him? I'm old school. I'm still using those <laughs> bad things. Um, how does it affect him, and what do I need to know to interact with him? Those are the first two questions. If you ask the parent that, the whole thing is going to go better. And this doctor had a nephew on the spectrum, I later learned. And so he asked me something very close to those two statements, and I explained to him. And so rather than he said normally we would immediately go to some big, long, skinny thing, they stick up your nose to pull it out, which was going to be traumatic for my son. And he instead told me about a method where he would leave the room and I could do it on my own. And it would just be, I had to like hold the other side shut and like blow into his mouth as hard as I could. The bead shot right out across the room. So like we avoided a major traumatic experience and probably a much bigger bill um, by him listening to what I told him and saying, if I, you know, if I can do anything, that's gonna go better than an unfamiliar person, you know, going up his nose. Um, and then blood draws were mentioned. Blood draws are very traumatic, but they have to have, we have to do them quarterly. We've had to do them quarterly since my boys were two and they're five and seven now. Um, it still can be a traumatic experience. Um, we have had to, my seven year old in the beginning, we would have to lay him down. We never had to do the, I think it's called the papoose. Or, mm -hmm. We'd never had to do that, but we would take usually two adults to give him lots of deep pressure so that it could be done and he would cry. Um, the family that I work with, the little boy throws up on the lab technician every time. Um, he lets them do it, but the stress and the anxiety of it, he, he'll vomit all over them. Um, the best thing I could tell you about that is to not immediately say, what did I do wrong? What's wrong? Can I? It's just to say, can I do anything to help? Because sometimes in those situations when the children are feeling that level of anxiety, the more language you're putting out, the more auditory processing they have to do, and now they're they're scared out of their mind. So the less you can say when it's already escalated to that, the better. Um, and just talk to the parent with minimal words and say, can I do anything? Because sometimes you can. Um, my, little, my little guy, my five-year-old, is excellent for blood draws because they let him sit in my lap. Um, somebody gives him deep pressure on his legs the entire time. I give him deep pressure across the middle of his body. I'm not holding him down. He doesn't try to get up. But that gives him an extra sense of knowing where he is, knowing that I'm behind him and you know, we're not gonna hurt him, this is a quick thing. Um, his bigger issue is when it's all said and done and he sits there and sometimes a tear will come down but he doesn't make a sound, he doesn't wanna wear the Band-Aid. The Band-Aid is a whole nother sensory <laughs> texture, I don't want that on me. So one time we had, um, 
I don't know what they're a lab technician um, who insisted that he get that band-aid on and while I'm dealing with my other son because we take them at the same time so there's only one traumatic day a quarter um, she kept trying to put it on and put another one on, put another one so he fought her really hard to the point he bled everywhere because then his blood pressure is raised and he's um, so when I told her if you'll just let me hold something there for a split second and then he looks with me okay is it done and we hold it there and as soon as it's done we take it off all is well um, and the majority of the time we try to use the same and you'll find that your, your autism moms are going to try to go to the um, blood draw when that same lady's working every time I mean I call and ask it's, it's not even kids with autism my son with Down syndrome is a tough stick and for years um, we had this gentleman at Children's who was up at Shrock Road I think his name is uh, was Howard. I could be wrong. And um, Howard was our go-to guy because he could find Pete's vein, and I would have to hold Pete the same way she's holding her little guy because I would have to bear hug him because he was scared. Not in a, but he, it was a good bear hug. And then Howard would talk to him about all the animals in the world. I don't know how he was able to focus on what he was doing, but I was all good with it, and he was able to get the blood. When it came to Pat, and we tried the same thing. Poor Howard he went gray after he had Pat because he, we tried some of those same techniques, but his sensory issues were so much that we couldn't calm him down enough to get him to understand that it was going. And I think part of that has to do with when you're pushing or you're finding. When they tie that thing around, around the, the arm. arm yeah. It sends him over That's the right. edge. But anyway, I want to say, so across the board, it's not just guys with autism. It's kids in general, but kids that may have some sensory issues or end or fear issues. It's how you approach them. Um, mm -hmm. or even young adults, the young adults with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sandra, do you want to talk about some of your healthcare experiences? Because I know you've had some. Well, they shared one thing that I did want to add is that it is very true about how you approach. If you walk into the room with anxiety about approaching us, we're going to pick up your anxiety right away, and we're going to start reacting to your anxiety. Um, because they say that with people with autism that we don't have emotions, but it's not true. We overly feel everything. Like I can feel everybody right now is emotions and energy in this room. And some of it's very <coughs> calm, but some of it's very overwhelming. Even though you're not speaking, I can still feel it. And, and so as a doctor, if you walk into the room and your energy's high um, because you're having one of those high energy kinds of days, you're gonna cause us to be overwhelmed and overloaded just by your energy. And if you're too calm and neutral, we're not gonna be able to read what's going on with you, then that's going to cause our anxieties and fears to increase. But if you come in anxious because you don't know how to address us, we're going to respond with the same way with you. You're not trustworthy because we can't read what's going on with you and where your energy is coming from. And so and that's one thing that I always see when tell teachers, you can dictate the mood by the moment you walk into the room. Um, and so, but with doctors in healthcare, I have multiple health issues and I don't mind sharing them, but I have Sjogren's and fibromyalgia, vitamin D deficiency, low IgA, asthma, and severe allergy issues to where my throat will close off with certain allergies. And, um, I have osteoporosis and the list can go on and on. Um, but the problem I have is that I don't have good eye contact and I'm not a good person to like when I sometimes when I've gone into the emergency room and I'm feeling really bad and my whole body is in pain and when the doctors are asking me where does it hurt I don't really know I just give a general idea of where it may be coming from and so they'll think that I'm being dishonest and they'll say oh well does it hurt over here and I'll say yes and they'll say how about down here and I'll say yes and it's because my whole body is in pain not because that I don't know how to answer the questions. Um, I've had a lot of health issues since I was very little and always told them my tummy hurts. Nobody would ever really do testing and stuff because they thought, oh, um, you know, because of the other diagnoses that I had. And at that time as a child, I had um, colitis. And so they blamed everything on the colitis, but nobody ever really investigated that it might be a female issue. And then, so for 20 or 30 something years, I have been in severe pain um, with the, the female organs. and. So I actually had to have a total hysterectomy because the first time a gynecologist actually did the right kinds of tests found that my uterus was literally tipped. One of the um, tubes was twisted around behind and it was just a mess. And 
I had suffered from that for years and years trying to communicate to doctors. I was in a lot of pain and nobody would address that until I had to have the hysterectomy. But um, that's what also helped me pro-advocate for myself before I went in for that surgery. I wrote out a two or three page, I think it was only two pages of a letter that shared to the surgeon <coughs> my sensory issues, my communication issues, and everything in basic detail, not a lot of information, but just the basics. And so when I went into the hospital, they were actually able to give me a room of my own because they knew one of the needs I had was a TV on 24-7 to get rid of background noise and for security reasons um, for myself and that would interfere with the health care of another patient but they addressed all of those things and that surgeon told me that that was the first time out of all of his years of being a doctor that he got the most information that he's ever needed to know about autism and asked if he could keep the paper and use it for some of his training and keep it on file at the Riverside Hospital area but they really were very helpful and very supportive through that whole healthcare process. Um, the bad part is that when I've tried to use that for emergency care or other hospitals, many of the doctors won't even look at it. They just kind of glance at it, oh, that's nice, and set it on a table. They won't even, and the, one of the problems I have is when I go to the emergency room, for example, if I'm very, very sick and running a fever, my body is in so much sensory overload, just trying to cope the sensory inputs so that I'm feeling and sensing. And it's really hard when you go in and triage asks you, why are you here? And then five minutes later, you're with the nurse and she asks you the same question. Then the doctor comes in and asks you the same question. And by that time when the doctor comes in, you're already building agitation, irritation, because you've already spent all the energy you had just telling triage and the nurse what the problems were. Wanna, I've had so many bad experiences with doctors that I'm actually um, really not trusting too much of doctors. I'm terrified of needles, IVs, um, any kinds of procedures. So most of the time now for my health care, they actually put me to sleep and to do any kinds of testing um, because my body cannot handle um, things. And one of, one of the most horrible experiences when I had to have an upper and lower scope, um, I shared to that doctor, that surgeon, that I had to be completely out because of my health issues and my developmental issues would be too much. He totally ignored me. I was wide awake to the whole procedure, trying to fight um, and push things back, was in so much pain, it hurt so much. And he just got real forceful and was kind of yelling at the nurse and myself and stuff and didn't even really finish the procedure. And ever since then, now I am terrified of any doctor that wants to do an upper or lower scope. And then I finally found a new doctor that does that, but he puts me completely out so I have no memory whatsoever of the experience. Another time I went to the emergency room, I was running extremely high fever. It was shortly after a surgery of having my gallbladder removed. And I thought maybe it was an infection of some sort, but I just was so sick and I couldn't really say my words very well. And so I went to the hospital. I got through triage okay with my words. The nurse was getting me a little edgy. And then the doctor comes in and says, um, and so you, what brings you here? And I was trying hard to still be patient and try to get my words out. And so I told him I had a high fever. He goes, oh, really? He said, what kind of thermometer did you use? Where did you put it? In your mouth, your bottom, or your underarm? And I'm thinking, what the heck is these kinds of questions? And then he sits down on the thing and leans way into my space and kept saying, are you sure there's nothing else you want to tell me? And then he was scaring me. I thought, what is this doctor's problem? What else am I supposed to be telling him? And so then I told him, because he built my agitation. I said, I'm not answering any more of your dumb questions. Please go away. And that made him mad. And he says, well, I can't help you if you're not going to answer any of my questions. So he left the room for a while, and I finally calmed down. But I was so glad just to get back out of there. I said, I didn't care if I went home and died that day because I was not going back to that doctor. And whatever the problem was, I was ready to be completely out of there. And, and and so that hospital in general, I won't even go back there. I refuse to go to that hospital for fear of seeing that doctor again. But that prevents us from getting the right kind of health care too. And sometimes doctors will tell you, well, you get home, I need you to do this, this, and this, and it's all verbal. When an autistic person goes home with that, 
they have no clue once they walk into the door what they were even supposed to do because it was verbal. It's not in detail or written out. So we go home and we don't follow through. And then we get sicker and we come back to our doctor and I say, well, why didn't you follow through? You can't follow through if you have no clue what you were even supposed to do or how to follow through. So those are some of my experiences Great. of healthcare. Okay. Rory, well, you've had some positive experiences with your, your primary care doctor right now. Do you want to tell us what makes the, that experience good for you? What works? Well, it's when I have um, a doctor that knows what they're doing and that I have the right medication and the right dose. Mm -hmm. um, if, 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 it, if it's a high dose, I'm kind of sensitive to, I'm kind of sensitive to medication in general. I only require a low dose of it. Mm -hmm. That's the same way with me. Many mm -hmm. times they think they give you adult dose and it actually overdoses us. Our systems, many of people with autism get hypersensitive to those medicines. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I told that to a lot of doctors, but I, the thing is I couldn't s seem to get that through to mm -hmm. anybody. So they didn't, you didn't feel like they listened to you very well yeah. with that. You did mention that your primary care doctor also listens and takes time with you. How does she, how do you, how does she let you know what she wants you to do and, um, um, she talked to you. She explains, well, she tries to explain things in a way that I m might be able to understand and mm -hmm. gives me advice on what, what to do and stuff like that, kind of like homework. Okay. Yeah. What kind? If you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, give us an example of what kind of homework she might give you. Like, um, <laughs> like practice, um, well, not. I don't know. Um, well, let's see. Does she give you advice about eating certain foods yeah. or that kind of that yeah. kind of homework thing? Yeah. Okay. Good. Does she write things down for you, or do, do, does it work pretty well if yeah, she just she, tells she you? Yeah, she writes things down for me. Okay. Okay. Good. 